Hey everybody, Joe here from the Lines Led by Donkeys podcast, but uh, I guess you probably already knew that. If you like what we do here on the show, consider supporting us on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash lines led by donkeys. Just $5 per month gets you every regular episode early, access to our community discord, a digital copy of my book, The Hooligans of Kandahar, as well as its audiobook read by me, and over five years of bonus content. By supporting the show, you support us and allow us to keep our show as it has always been ad-free. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. Once again, Joe flinched visibly as I started doing the intro because he was about to do it. I I have been uh, conditioned as if by a Russian scientist to whenever we do our clap sync in the beginning to roll into the intro. And now that I don't, it uh, for the last four weeks, it is um, it's caused me to sweat a bit. I mean, that could be because I'm drinking <laughs> hot coffee in 94 degree weather, but it could uh, look who's, who's to tell which one it is. <laughs> this is your version of the numbers, Mason. <laughs> but uh, you're very welcome back to part four and the final. Oh, also, I am Tom. Uh, I'm. Uh, Irish Tom is in the hosting chair this time. As opposed to the other Tom that uh, regularly comes on the show. Uh, yeah. yeah. So this is part four, our final part of the RAF series. If you're tuning in on this episode, go back and listen to the other ones. If you haven't, nothing will make sense about what we're about to talk about. agent of chaos listening haven't. from part four back to part one. Uh, the Benjamin Button of the uh, fucking Red Army faction. <laughs> So, Joe, what do you think of the of the Red Army faction so far? Well, like I said before, I didn't know a lot, really much of anything going uh, about them going into this, other than, you know, we've occasionally touched on them, uh, kind of like on the periphery, especially whenever we talk about Muammar Gaddafi and the PLO and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say they're a lot more prolific than I thought. Like, I know they carry, mm-hmm. they, like, I know of a few attacks they carried out, but, uh, oh, fun fact, S got a, a notification on my computer saying record high temperature for Yerevan. Cool. Uh, but <laughs> I, uh, like I wasn't aware of like the, the weird, almost slapstick nature of their organization and how they function. I, I, I feel like that's not unique to, mm-hmm. uh, the Red Army faction. I feel I want to say that's probably the case for most groups of their kind. Like, obviously, you have like truly international terror groups, like you know, uh, the 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 greater PLO umbrella during their heyday, Al Qaeda, ISIS. Not comparing the three of them, but like there, there, there's more of an international organization and almost like a centralization of leadership. They have a they have a leader. Um, so that tends to, I guess, make things a little bit more smooth, as smooth as, you know, being international terrorists can be. While the Red Army factions seem to be like bickering college students. You know, the big difference, as I see it, is the Red Army faction was never really a paramilitary organization. It was much more kind of stochastic terrorism, like kind of unstructured strike when you can. In this episode, we'll get into much more of their organized operations. And the bombing campaign that ended them up in prison is really the most organized operation that they undertook. But it's very different from, say, something like the PLO or even the IRA, where it is like there is some sort of command structure in place, you know, making it a paramilitary organization. Whereas really it's Andreas Bader. Gudrun Ensling and the rest of them kind of figuring out, oh, what do we do next? I, th- I think like, and it, like the history of terrorism is not my field. Um, however, like I, I, I think a main difference is a lot of these terror groups, even other leftist militant paramilitary and terror groups, like the leader of their group is generally seen as like, when we take over, this guy is going to be mm. in charge. And that tends to streamline things a lot better. Where, yeah. like, I mean, unless there's something hidden in the writings or something I haven't learned yet, like, Andreas Bader or Rika Meinhof is ever like, I'm going to be the the Communist Party chairperson of Communist West Germany. Like, that's not really... They seem to be serving an ideology rather than an organization, um, which is kind of what I expect from a group of, like, fresh out of college kids, you know? Yeah, and it they did get their training, you know, 
from FATA and the PLO. But it was more so, you know, it was ideologically ideologically driven rather than a concrete goal. Right. Like if you look at something like the IRA in the seventies, the goal was to end British occupation in Northern Ireland and a reunified Ireland in, you know, the name of Irish Republicanism with the PLO. It's the return of, you know, lands to the Palestinians. And other groups generally have like a very clear, definable goal. Whereas when you have groups that are driven by, you know, a not necessarily vague goals, but like less easily defined ones, this is kind of what you get. Yeah. um, Like, obviously, they're being funded in some part and supported by the CED, which is the Communist Party of East Germany. Um, I believe it's the CED. And the and the KDP to some extent, which is the Communist Party of West Germany, but was one of the stated goals of the RAF even the reunification of Germany? Not not really. It was more so like the opposition to state oppression. But it's a very broad goal, I must say. Yeah. Um. When we left off the last episode, three of the four main members of the RAF had just been picked up. That is Gudrun Ensing. Jan Perl Rasp, Andreas Bader, and Holger Mein. So all five of them have been picked up. Bader got um, his leg completely shattered by a sniper's bullet. Yeah, but there's one person who we conspicuously left out at the end of the last episode, and that is Ulrika Meinhof, who was separated from all the rest of them at this time. But on Thursday the 5th of June, just before midnight, someone rang the doorbell of an apartment owned by a teacher in Waldsroder Strasse um, in Hanover. When he opened the door in his dressing gown and saw a young woman with long brown hair standing outside, the teacher later told the police uh, that he didn't know her and he uh, she asked, may I have a word with you? He let the woman in. She looked distressed and they entered his living room. She asked, could two people sp- spend the night tomorrow with you? He agreed and next morning at breakfast he told his girlfriend about this visit. She said there was only one very specific conclusion to be drawn. You must go to the police. So, at the police station, he was immediately referred to the Bader Meinhof Special Commission. Police officer Robert Severin was approaching retirement. He and two younger colleagues were detailed to go and find out the best way of keeping watch on the apartment. So, in plain clothes, they assessed the possibilities of, of you know, hiding in the stairwell to watch the building. And as they were about to leave the apartment complex at nearly 6pm, a woman and a young man came towards them. The caretaker of the building was standing at the doorway and asked the couple where they were going. They told him, and the caretaker pointed up the stairs and directed them to the second floor to the apartment they were looking for, but he said that the owner wasn't in, so they probably won't get in. So the pair went upstairs, and the police officers asked for reinforcements. They were still discussing whether or not they ought to enter the apartment without a search warrant when the young man came out of the building. The officers picked him up in a telephone booth, he had just put a coin in a slot to in the slot to make a call. The officers threw open the doors and grabbed a pistol from him. Severin, who had come out of the operation unarmed, stuck it in his pocket. But none of them realized they had just arrested Ulrika Meinhof. One of the <clears> most <throat> wanted people in West Germany, and they had no idea they arrested her. Yeah, after they arrested the man when they went up to the apartment and they got her, they didn't realize that it was Ulrika Meinhof. Um, but because she looked so thin and so like sickly that she didn't resemble the photographs on the wanted posters at all. She's got the revolutionary aesthetic. Yeah. So when the policemen searched uh, the apartment, they found a bag containing an open copy of an illustrated magazine stern showing x-ray pictures of Ulrika Meinhof's skull. Huh. Okay. Because bear remember in episode one or two, we talked about how Ulrika Meinhof had to have metal clip placed on her brain for a blood vessel. That is true. Yeah. So she, wait, they figured out who she was because she happened to have a scan of her own brain laying around? So essentially what happened is after she was taken into custody, they did a scan to confirm her identity. And obviously she had a scar on her head, so they confirmed it was her that way. Um... But also, when they searched her jacket that was lying in the apartment, they took out a letter out of it, out of the pocket. It was Gudrun Essling's letter to Ulrika Meinhof. So that just like doubled down. Okay, this is who it is. Oh, God, this is like when uh, like a murderer gets caught because they have like a Google document on their computer that says like how to get away with murder. 
<laughs> so with Ulrika Meinhof now imprisoned, all of them are locked up. And for the first year, all of the RAF prisoners were in separate, you know, confinement. They were all isolated from each other and from normal life in the prison. So they all spent the first year in isolation. Oof. I mean, I'm not surprised. Um, <clears throat> and no one's going to let their local militant group all be bunkies, you know? Mm-hmm. So Andreas Bader was in jail in Schwalmstadt. Gudrun Ensling was in Essen. Holger Mines was in Wittlich. Uh, Im- Irmgard Moller was in Ratstadt. Gerhard Mueller in Hamburg. Jan Karl Rasp in Cologne. And Ulrika Meinhof was in Cologne's Ossendorf jail in a cell that used to be Astrid Prohl's cell. <laughs> Uh, I I wonder if the, like her name was scratched on the wall or something like that. Like, yeah. So during her eight months in isolation, Ulrika Meinhof was only allowed visits from family, and at that, it was only for half an hour once every two weeks under the supervision of the guards. I gotta say, I assumed it'd be worse. Like, I'm not saying that's good. Uh, I kind of figured it'd be like. You know, uh, when a terrorist in the U.S. is, I mean, this is a long time ago. Germany is obviously a little bit more forgiving in their penal system. I'm sure Germans will write in and tell me I'm completely incorrect on that, and it's fine. Uh, But, like, if you get arrested for terrorism, say, like, the guy who tried to blow up the airplane over Detroit with a bomb in his underwear, like, they send you to a place called ADX Florence, which we've talked about before, which is, like, no visitors, no letters, no phone calls. You, uh, You get stuffed into a hole to die, and I kind of assumed the Germans would do the same thing, especially because obviously the state is terrified of these people. Well, like, this is the thing, and this will come up, like, much later in the script that, you know, they weren't put in an oubliette. They were, you know, put in regular cells just away from all the other prisoners. Now, bear in mind, they were very bare bones, Mm -hmm. but, you know, as time goes on, they get more amenities and kind of more concessions. While in isolation, Ulrika Meinhof wrote a lot about how she was feeling. You know, that feeling that your head is exploding, that feeling that the top of your skull must be, must be going to split off and come off, the feeling of your spinal cord pressing into your brain, the feeling that the cell is moving, you wake up and open your eyes and the cell is moving in the afternoon when the sun shines in, it suddenly stops, you can't shake off that sense of movement. Furious aggression for which there is no outlet, that the worst thing, uh, that's the worst thing. A clear awareness that your chance of survival is nil. Utter failure to communicate that. Visits leave no trace behind them. Half an hour later, you can tell if the visit was today or last week only by mechanically reconstructing it. On the other hand, a bath once a week a bath once a week means a moment's thawing out. Recovery. And that feeling persists for a few hours. The feeling that time and space interlock. So, this is really, you know... They're like, she kind of sums it up. They're all in isolation for a year. Yeah, it's not good for your mental health. I mean, uh, uh, even, I don't know how, you know, behavioral sciences were back then, but today we, we certainly know like, oh, wow, this is, it's torture. Uh, I'm kind of curious, like ideologically, did they have, did they ever write about like, you know, we'll die before we get taken in, we'll become martyrs because like they... They had to know that this was a possibility. They were blowing up people. Hold on to that thought once okay. again. So, uh, do you know what we get to talk about next? Uh, bombs? Is it, is it bombs? Black September. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, on the 5th of September, 1972, at 4.30 a.m., a commando unit, the Palestinian group Black September, climbed the fence of the Olympic Village in Munich. They forced their way into the Israeli team's quarters and shot two Israeli athletes. Nine others were taken hostage, and the commando unit were demanding the release of Palestinian prisoners in Israel, as well as the release of their comrades in the Red Army faction. And finally failing out that PLO training camp's coming in handy for these guys. (laughs) So that evening, the hostages and their captors were taken to Fustenfeldbruck Airport and were were ostensibly flown to Cairo. As the first two Palestinians were about to enter the aircraft, two German sharpshooters opened fire. The hostage takers mowed down the Israelis with Kalashnikovs. I should point out here, I mean, we'll eventually do it like a series or or something on the uh, Munich massacre. 
these guys were not sharpshooters. They didn't have scopes. They didn't have night vision. Mm. They were. That's why they missed. Like they, <laughs> they, they were meant to drop all of the hostage takers at the same time to stop this from happening. Because obviously they machine gun the hostages. One terrorist throws a hand grenade into one of the helicopters that has the hostages in them. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of one of the reasons why after this, West Germany actually forms this like a counter terror unit because mm-hmm. everybody in the world is like, wow, you guys really fuck this up. Then they return fire on the police, and at the end of the day, 11 Israeli athletes, one German policeman, and five of the Black September members were dead, and three Palestinians were arrested. The organizer of that attack, according to investigations by Mossad, was Hassan Salome, the same Abu Hassan that Andreas Bader argued about having a hot-cooked chicken. (laughs) It would be really funny if... Uh, uh, Hassan Salameh was like, "Look, you, we demand the release of our comrades in arms, except Andreas Potter." <laughs> that, but see, that is a badder level of pettiness that I think would have been like really funny. That would have been great. Like, yes, I just uh, organized up until that point one of the most prolific terror attacks in human history. Yes, I still carry this petty grudge from years ago in from Jordan or wherever. So, in response to the massacre, Ulrika Meinhof wrote a statement. The comrades of the Black September movement, she wrote, have brought their own Black September of 1970, when the Jordanian army slaughtered more than 20,000 Palestinians home to the place whence whence that massacre sprang. West Germany, former Nazi Germany, now the centre of imperialism. The place from which Jews of Western and Eastern Germany were forced to emigrate to Israel, the place from which Israel derived its capital by way of restitution and officially got its weapons until 1965. The place that, cele- that was celebrated by the Springer Press when they, hailed, when they hailed Israel's Blitzkrieg of June 67 as an anti-communist orgy. This is really the origins of a lot of the accusations of anti-Semitism that are level- levied to- are leveled towards the Red Army faction. It's kind of it's this statement and also, you know, subsequent support for the PLO and the PLFP. Yeah. And other things that come later, I'm sure. I mean, like, you know, we've talked about this before on the show and uh, especially during our uh, Entebbe raid bonus episode, we talked about like there was the German leftists. They were not part of the RAF. They part of something of a splinter group kind of. And, uh, <laughs> they kind of fell apart under a pile of anti-Semitism from their leadership. And one of the, the, the hostage takers uh, who was confronted with a uh, Holocaust survivor with their, like their, their camp tattoo on their wrist. And, and she pointed out like a German is holding a, a, a Jewish person at gunpoint who, ju- who survived the Holocaust a few decades ago. And he comes back with like, whoa, 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 I'm not a Nazi. I'm just an idealist. <laughs> Hold on to that thought. We're going to talk about that at the very end. Oh, no. This statement would cause so much infighting among the prisoners. In in response, you know, Gudrun Edsling, Andreas Bader were mad that Ulrika Meinhof put out this statement on behalf of the RAF. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't didn't pass this through the the struggle session or whatever first. Well, speaking of the struggle session. Oh, god damn it. Uh... Very quickly, as they were separated and they did not have any way to communicate with each other, they would begin, you know, communicating with each other using a complicated system of code names based on the book Moby Dick. <laughs> notes were notes were passed to lawyers, which were then communicated back to the other prisoners through a series of letters, you know, passed back and forth. At, at this time, the letters were uncensored and judges allowed info to be passed back and forth under the guise of, you know... This is just legal communication. Um, okay. So this was done in order to, um, for, in order for the political identity and revolutionary consciousness of the group to remain intact. But with the mail from their defending lawyers, the members of the group in custody regularly received copies of all of the letters they wrote to each other. It seems like um, it's not legal correspondence. <laughs> so these. These letters included, you know, private correspondence and sometimes exercises in what they called criticism and self-criticism. 
They were doing struggle sessions by correspondence. Yeah. Like one of the RAF prisoners, Klaus Jungsk, wrote in August 1974, I had been acting like a counter-revolutionary shit instead of exposing my deficiencies and const- and consistently extending my training by means of info, etc. I just absorbed the info rather than using it as a tool, as equipment for the struggle. So this kind of news circular of criticism, self-criticism, and also communication in order to keep the group strong will become so increasingly important as we go through this final episode. Mm, okay. I mean, you're, they're bored in a prison cell, isolated. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to be more self-critical in any moment of their life and they're going to be right then. <laughs> <laughs> so, at the end of 1972, Andreas Bader was called to give evidence at the trial of Horst Mahler in Berlin. He, Ulrike Meinhof, and Astrid Prohl were called by the defense to supply information about conditions in jail. And from today, said Bader, I won't eat until those conditions are changed. Bader's words were in every newspaper the next day, and with them started all of the RAF prisoners on hunger strike, their first, which lasted for almost two months. Holy shit, how did they die? How did they not die? Um... We'll, we'll get onto yeah, that. They got that German reserve sausage supply somewhere in their cell. I don't know. Like, the thing is, is that, like, for 60 days, they could survive, but this is something we're going to talk about in a second. But, you know, communications between prisoners in various jails had improved considerably with the introduction of this info system that we just talked about. Some 40 prisoners took part in the second hunger strike, including some who were member who were not members of the Red Army faction. The second hunger strike, which lasted six weeks from the 8th of May to the 29th of June 1973, the prison authorities employed forcible feeding for the first time. Ah, uh, after a slow... Okay. Yeah, yeah. The prison... So, but they realised that this wasn't going to be a solution to the problem. So after the, the slight easing of the convi- conditions of the prisoners, probably in part due to the widespread publicity given by the strike, the prisoners began eating again. All while this was going on, the preparations of the Stamheim prison, all while this was going on, the preparations of the Stamheim prison were continuing where all the prisoners were meant eventually to be held. All of them being kept separately was presenting a logistical nightmare for prison authorities, but on the 28th of April 1974, Gudrun Ensling and Ulrika Meinhof were moved to cells 718 and 719 on the seventh floor of the Stamheim prison, further referred to as the Bader Meinhof wing. <laughs> God, now they're so privileged to get a whole wing of their own prison. <laughs> so, uh, but this is like they are the highest security prisoners in the entirety of Germany. That's fucking wild to me. I mean, I was th- I yeah. was thinking for a moment because, like, I think Rudolf Hess is still being held, but I mm-hmm. I do remember that he was being held in uh, England. He wasn't being held in Germany. So, like, <laughs> why why do this? Any like Rudolf Hess, Chucky Taylor, or well, Charles Taylor Senior is held in England. I think because uh, Charles Taylor is being held there because uh, like some kind of ICC agreement. Um, okay. and Hess is being, well, well, obviously isn't anymore. He'd be some kind of undead monster at this point. Uh, but he was being <laughs> held in England because that's where he fled via airplane and, and okay. because his whole thing, and one day we'll do an episode about him is he was not mentally well before he got there. And he mm-hmm. believed if he jumped on a plane, acted as an emissary for Nazi Germany, he could end the war by negotiating with, yeah. uh, with, uh, Britain. And instead, he was just arrested for the rest of his life. So, with the arrival of the new prisoners, some new rules were set about, you know, their confinement and how they were to conduct themselves daily. According to this order, their cells numbered 718 and 719 on the seventh floor of the building were to be double locked day and night. Two men and one one female prison officer were to be present at all times whenever the cells were opened. The prisoners were allowed to wear their own clothes and underwear. Food was handed out in the kitchen to the officers on duty who signed for it and then delivered to the prisoners. So it's like uh, what we'd consider like modern day solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
the pair were allowed to take an hour and a half of yard exercise together every day on the roof terrace of the seventh floor seventh floor of the building. During the day, they would be locked in the same cell for four hours. Their cells were to be particularly thoroughly searched daily. They were to have body searches at regular intervals. Female prison officers had to look in in on one of the prisoners at least once an hour until 8 p.m. They could have a bath twice a week, though not on Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. We love when our personal hygiene runs on banker hours. <laughs> a business hour bath. Yeah. The prisoners were barred from all community activities, including going to church, and only visits from family and their lawyers were allowed. Mm-hmm. I mean, that seems... Like, that still sucks, but it sounds better than I thought it'd be. Yeah. Like, I think, in general, stuff that we'll get into later aside, it's not the worst. Like, they're not being put in an oubliette. And this is not me apologizing for the carceral system. Okay, first of all, what the fuck is an oubliette? What kind of what kind of cursed British thing are you bringing me? It's actually French. So an oubliette is a hole in the ground with a grate on the top, and you you put a prisoner in it. Ah, get, give him the core V-Rop treatment. <laughs> yeah, so it's a dungeon with the only entrance or exit being a trapdoor in the ceiling. The the Jesse Pinkman prison cell from the end of Breaking Bad. Yeah, so it, like it was developed in the Middle Ages by the Normans in Eng- in English prisons. Fair enough. <laughs> like I said, um, cursed the Br- cursed British things. So over a period of several months, the prisoners prepared for a, f- a new hunger strike. Their third, it was to be their longest and their th- and their toughest, and it ended in death. And uh, Andreas Bader wrote about it. I don't think we shall call it a hunger strike this time. That means some people will die. I mean, you could still call it a hunger strike. Hunger strikes, you know, famously, we've talked about Bobby Sands. Um, like, yeah, the end goal of an under stri- a hunger strike is obviously to get your demands or mm-hmm. die with the idea yeah. that the public relations disaster of having a prisoner die under your watch would be too shameful for the state to take. Mm hmm. And this is, you know, something that will come up once their trial begins, is the idea of using the body as a weapon, as, you know, this is the last weapon that a prisoner has, Mm. and it is the most useful thing they can do. Well, it's certainly not the last weapon these prisoners would have. (laughs) Mm. So, over this time, the relationship grew even more tenuous, and in August 1974, Andreas Bader copied Ulrika Meinhof's self-criticism for the info system, and it goes as follows. The essential thing, my disturbed relationship with you both, that is Gudrun Ensling and Andreas Bader, uh, and particularly Andreas, will arise from the fact that I wasn't animated by revolutionary violence. It was just a phase, it was just a phrase shamelessly used as compared to my situation now. My social development towards fascism through sadism and religion, which caught up with me because I never fully resolved my relationship to it, I mean the ruling class, and I was once its darling, had kept killing things inside me. That really bad part of my delusion, behaving to the RAF as I used to behave to the ruling class, toadying, I don't really know what this word means, toadying, but hey, someone, someone let me know. Toadying is kind of like a slang term for like becoming like subservient to... Like being oh, a, like okay. if someone says you're a toady, like you're kind of like a servant. Oh, okay. It's kind of like a tout in Ireland. Sure. I've never heard that one before. <laughs> um, I mean, treating you like cops, which simply means I was like a cop myself a long time. In the psychological mechanisms of domination and submission, of fear and clinging to the rules, a hypocritical bitch from the ruling class that merely self-knowledge, everything just as if so andreas bader obviously put this self-criticism in the you know info circuit in order to get at ulrika meinhof you know i don't know necessarily whether it's because he was worried that she was going to flip on all of them to save herself right but this is kind of a long continuity in you know both gudrun ensling and andreas bader targeting ulrika meinhof you know it goes back as far as, you know, 
him calling her a bourgeois cunt for for feeling guilty about abandoning her children or you know him targeting her during the grenade training because she didn't throw it away mm. you know this is a long continuity and it's something that a criticism that I don't think anyone can really come back against is that like Andreas Bader was like a person who deeply deeply seemed well seemed to deeply deeply hate women I'm kind of getting that feeling because his all of his criticisms are safe for the only person in the group who could kind of sort of challenge his leadership and who happened to be a woman and not to mention he doesn't really have anything in his life right like he's been kind of sort of disconnected from society at large when this whole thing started. He was, you know, a petty criminal. He didn't really have a lot of friends, no relationship with his family. Well, Ulrika Meinhof was married. She had children. Like, she had a life before all this, which was unique because she dropped it all. And he still yep. uses that as a cudgel, despite the fact, like, she gave what could have been effectively a very normal life for what they considered mm-hmm. the struggle. And he gave up nothing. Yeah, and also to bear in mind that Andreas Bader also, you know, believed that women were not part of the working class. Uh, that's telling. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he so he's a deeply sexist asshole who's attacking the only other woman of stature within his group, even when they're both in fucking prison. So the other RAF prisoners received the document together with self reproaches from everyone else. Margaret Schiller wrote hatred. Uh, I was always terrified of Andreas Bader, which was the only nasty, so- which was only the other nasty side of hate. Defense against being taken over by someone who couldn't, who couldn't or wouldn't be corrupted. Replying to Schiller, uh, Gudrun Ensing described the characteristics of Andreas Bader's role in the group: the rival, absolute enemy, enemy of the state, the collective consciousness. The morale of the humiliated and insulted of the urban proletariat, that's what Andreas is. Uh, in, in clear, non-theory-based English, he's a dick. Yeah. <laughs> he, he is a miserable asshole who hates women. Mm. But she went on. Hence the hatred of the bourgeoisie, the press, the middle class left concentrated on him because... On the 14th of May, 1970, the date of the freeing of Bader in Berlin has turned out to mean just that, the struggle for power. It was the first battle we won, an armed rescue operation, our our model. We could measure ourselves by Andreas, by what he is, because he wasn't the old order anymore, open to blackmail, corruption, etc., but the new order, clear, strong, implacable, determined, because he governs himself by our aims. I would disagree with... I mean, you can't... I mean, I don't know how you square the circle exactly, but, like, you can't say things like that when he fundamentally thinks that women cannot be a part of the working class. He sees everybody outside the working class as being an enemy. Yep. Like, <laughs> that's just bigotry. He's just... Yeah, he's just communist Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Andreas Bader <laughs> I have nothing against our women comrades other than the fact I believe that being born with a uterus makes you inherently bourgeoisie <laughs> oh people are gonna be so mad at us like if if people are mad at this man's own words and the words of his comrades you're not mad at us you're mad at a dead guy but on the 2nd of October 1974 the Federal Prosecutor General officially indicted the five core members of the group Andreas Bader, Gudrun Ensling, Ulrika Meinhof, Holger Mines, and Jan Karl Rasp. In November, Bader and Rasp were moved to Stamheim. Holger Mines would remain in Whitlich due to his failing health caused by the previous hunger strike. At the beginning of every hunger strike, the prisoners gave the prison officers all the food they had in their cells. Biscuits, chocolate, soup cubes were packed up and deposited in the food cell outside of the prisoner's reach. But more than not, foodstuffs had been kept back and hidden among books uh, and were occasionally found during the regular inspection of the cells. But the more often hunger strikes were staged over the years, being employed as a, quote, weapon against your own body, the more that weapon wore out. The general public 
didn't really know that the strikes were being were taking place. The prison officers and you know the security apparatus tried to keep it quiet. So of course, it, it limits their strength. Yeah, and at this stage, quite a lot of tabloid press that weren't explicitly right wing, like the Springer Press, were sympathetic to their cause. The prisoners took to eating increasingly often in secret. Once Bubeck found that one of the defending lawyers had a dozen ham sandwiches with him in his files. <laughs> he's, he's going through his law files like, you know, motion to s- dismiss, motion for an attorney, ham sandwich, ham sandwich, ham sandwich. <laughs> but this is, this is because all of the files and the conversations between the lawyers and the prisoners were meant to be, you know, private and confidential. So... Their file binders weren't searched. Right. And I think that's still the case in most prison systems that legal correspondence is privileged and also apparently full of ham sandwiches. So when he spoke to the lawyer about it, the man said he was diabetic and had to eat frequently. Bubek said to him, not very tactful, is it? Eating in front of Herr Bader while he's on hunger strike. (laughs) Oh, this is great. Like, I am on the hunger strike. Uh, sir, your uh, ham sandwich literally just fell out of your pocket. Oh no, you you do <laughs> not understand. It's uh, I am not on hunger strike for 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 food. I am on hunger strike for uh, dairy. You see, uh, it makes my <laughs> tummy very upset. Herr Bada, I can see bread in your teeth. <laughs> that is that is just a fur coat to keep me warm in my prison cell. That's just plaque that's building up from all the food I'm not eating. (laughs) So at the end of October 1974, Manfred Grashoff gave up on his hunger strike, but resumed it a few days later. In this situation, Holger Mines, then, you know, extremely malnourished from his own hunger strike. The one guy who's actually doing the hunger strike? Like, wow, you guys aren't losing any weight. What's going on? He said, you are not with us anymore. You are saving your own skin and just and thus giving the pigs a victory, that's uh, that's to say, if you deliver us up, you are a pig yourself, a pig defecting, going behind our backs that so, so that you can survive personally. In that case, I mean, if you're not going on with our hunger strike, you'd better, you'd do better and more honorably, if you still know what honor is to say, there is, there it is, I'm alive, down with the RAF, up with the pig system and included included this little poem either a pig or a man either survival at any price or a fight to the death either problem or solution there's nothing in between i'm just picturing an uh, raf symbol with the red star instead of the mp5 submachine just a fist clasping a hand sandwich this is one of the few parts that i find genuinely quite sad on November 8th, 1974, the first of the RAF prisoners would martyr themselves for the cause. Holger Mines got in touch with his lawyers and instructed them to come visit quickly. The following morning, on Saturday the 9th, Mines' lawyer, Siegfried Haig, arrived at the prison but was not permitted entry to visit Mines. Haig, pressing the fatality of the issue and that a doctor that could be trusted by Mines be brought in, the judge allowed Hag to visit, but refused to supply a doctor. Two of the prison officers carried Mo- Holger Mines into a room in the administration area on a stretcher. His eyes were half closed. Siegfried Hag bent over him and put his ear to his lips. I'm finished. It's over. I'm dying, whispered Holger Mines. Over the next two hours, Hag stayed bent over Mines' stretcher as the two had their last conversation. Finally, Holger Mines asked his asked Hag for a cigarette. He lit it and put it between Holger Mines' lips. And with that, Hag left. Soon, Holger Mines will be pronounced dead. It only makes me hate the rest of this group. Like, they struggle sessioned one another into taking part in these hunger strikes as a collective action while they're all eating. And this fucking person starves to death. Yeah. Like, thinking that they're doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Once the news of Holdermine's death had been broadcast, there was immediately protest marches in the streets of Frankfurt, Cologne, Hamburg, Stuttgart, and Berlin. On the 10th of November, 1974, the day after the death of Holdermine's, Gunther von Drenkmann, President of the Superior Court of Justice and Berlin's senior judge, 
was assassinated on his doorstep by a man posing as a flower shop delivery man. It's worth noting that he had no connection to the RAF case and it would later be suggested that he had been killed by a 2nd of June commando movement in a botched attempt to kidnap him. But nonetheless, this was seen in the media as the as revenge for the death of Holger Mines. I could see that. I could see that going either way because, I mean, he's a even though he's not connected to the case, he's still a judge. 2,000 people attended the funeral of Holger Mines, Holger Mines in Hamburg. There were chants calling for revenge and at it, journalists took a now iconic photo, which I actually, anytime I look at it, I find quite moving, of Rudi Deutsch, the man who got shot in the face at the start of episode two, holding his beret in his left hand and his right clenched in a fist in anger and calling out, Holger, the fight goes on. It's such a shitty situation. Like, obviously, like, I don't sympathize with the Red Army faction and I don't sympathize with the German state. Uh, but, you know, we expect the German state to do what they did to Hol- Holger Mines, right? Like, uh, he's in prison. We expect him to be treated badly because that's what prisons do. I mean, that's what they still do. They're awful. We're not here to support the carceral state. My criticisms of are the rest of the group that allowed him to starve to death. You know, you're supposed to act as a collective. You're supposed to have one You've- guiding ideology that you all talk each other into through these the smuggled fucking lawyer based pony express. And you allow someone you believe to be your comrade arms to fucking starve himself to death while you're hoarding ham sandwiches and bouillon cubes and shit it's one of the more fucked up things that we've talked about in the series i think joe hold on to that thought andreas batter obviously did not take his hunger strike too seriously of course he fucking didn't once after a lawyer had visited him in his cell he vomited and brought up pieces of chicken see this all goes back to his time at the plo camp he just wanted a nice cooked chicken Yeah. On another occasion, prison officers found 200 grams of chopped roast meat wrapped in a handkerchief carried in by another lawyer. He, uh, the lawyer argued that this was, you know, his, you know, tea time treat. At the same time, Bather was proving himself zealous in the common cause. He frequently used green ink in his communiques as denoting that he was the leader in his notes to the others. An insufferable prick. He's he's like the only guy who gained weight during a hunger strike. Oh, Joe, just wait. He wrote to Ulrika Meinhof in his green pen, but of course you're one of those liberal cunts. You liberate yourself only in the fight and not by whirling around yourself in the fight like a spinning top. And of course, what you're producing does it no good either. This guy sucks. I hate him so... Like, before I just thought he was, uh, like, you know, the the telltale petty criminal turned revolutionary, um, whatever... But n- now mm. I'm just learning he is just a misogynistic dickhead. Yeah. And then around this time, Andreas Bader got a, a an unusual visitor. Do you want to know who it is? Unusual vis- visitor. Hmm. I'm going to assume some agent of the state. It was Jean-Paul Sartre. Fucking what? So Jean-Paul Sartre in the previous, you know, couple of weeks had made a statement of his sympathy to the treatment of the Red Army faction prisoners. So, he was Fair invited enough. to- We don't have to like people to believe that they should be treated well. Mm-hmm. So, he decided to visit Andreas Bader, partially to, you know, understand what he thought as, you know, he had called them a quote-unquote force. So, you know, he wanted to understand- their beliefs, their motivations, etc., etc. So when the two greatest intellectual minds of the 20th century met in a small prison cell, do you know what happened? Did Sartre fucking hate him? He absolutely fucking hated <laughs> Andreas Bader. He, he called him an asshole. <laughs> the guy kept chain smoking and offering me sandwiches. <laughs> yeah, so after he, the visit, Sartre, you know, spoke in kind of a press conference and spoke and spoke about the you know the conditions the prisoners are being held in and you know squalid conditions you know empty cells there was only one problem jean Paul Sartre was 69 and nearly half blind and was more than likely confused 
the meeting room that they met in that had no furniture with their actual cells. Ah, uh, yeah, that'll that'll do it. I do. I cannot believe they have only given you a table and two chairs to live on. <laughs> Like, like at this stage, you know, the prison... And this is not to say that this alleviates being in prison. No, I'm sure it's awful. They had, they had radios, you know, they had books. Uh, I think Young Carl Rasp had a record player. Shit, that's better know. than some fucking prisons today. <laughs> yeah, so like, you know, the conditions were not, not to be what Sartre believed they were. And it's likely due to the fact that... I can't remember if he had two heart attacks or two strokes and was like half blind at this stage and 69 years of age. Nice. Yeah, you know, Sim- Simone de Beauvoir did a real job on it. <laughs> I mean, it is endlessly funny. This guy is like holds a press conference. He's like, look, the man is just terrible. But then, <laughs> but that doesn't mean he needs to be treated this way. Even, even history's assholes should be treated with some modicum of respect. This hunger strike would last 140 days. That's not a hunger strike. That's just a crash diet. They're, they're doing keto in prison. <laughs> yeah, the, they got really into prison CrossFit and started doing paleo shit. You so don't understand. This- you only need to eat nuts and seeds and the occasional roast smuggled in by your lawyer. Around the same time, a new generation of revolutionaries would go underground. Many of the new groups that had sprung up in the previous two years since the group's imprisonment had no connection to Bader, Meinhof, Ensling, or any of the group. Ah, the telltale leaderless ha- resistance. Yeah, so many of them had not met the enigmatic leaders and were instead motivated into action by the injustice visited, visited upon the imprisoned parties. Mm-hmm. This would include groups such as Red Aid and the Committee Against Torture and Isolation, the further radicalizing Commune 1, which we talked about in the first episode, and, you know, 2nd of June movement and other left-wing groups that were slowly getting more, you know, radicalized and more violent. Mm. One such person was Volker Spital, who, after the death of Holger Mines, wrote, The death of Holger Mines and the decision to take to the gun were one and the same. Sober thought was impossible by now. It was simply the emotional drive of the last few months reacting. But at this point... The police had mostly wiped out the RAF, save for some explosives and money that had been left over from prior to the group's arrest. This was when the second generation of the RAF began to form in earnest alongside the growth of other groups. On the 27th of February 1975, a group of six people organised under the banner of the 2nd of June movement kidnapped the Berlin mayoral candidate for the CDU, Peter Lawrence, three days before the voting would begin. At seven minutes to nine, that's 8.53 a.m. for the Americans, on the 27th of February, 1975, Peter Lawrence left his home in the Zehendorf district. Three minutes later, 150 or 1,500 metres from his house, a four-ton truck blocked the road across from his Mercedes and a Fiat rammed it. Lawrence's driver was knocked out with a broomstick and the CDU mayoral candidate himself dragged into a car standing ready. You gotta love a terror attack carried out via a bludgeon, a bludgeoning on a, by, via broomstick. <laughs> whack, 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 whack. <laughs> so they demanded the release of 2nd of June prisoners as well as Horst Mahler, which kind of weird. Horst Mahler is much more connected to... The commune one movement than the RAF. He was a member of the RAF, but had much more close ties to mm-hmm. them. And it's also worth noting that the prisoners they demanded to be released, none of them had been convicted of murder or attempted murder. It was just, you know, it was a smart move because it was it was demands that could be met. Mm. At least it's reasonable. I mean, all think well, reasonable in comparison, you know. Mm-hmm. So the transfer was negotiated by former West German mayor Heinrich Alberts and upon meeting the kidnappers and negotiating with them to come to terms when he left the negotiating room he asked the police officers that were nearby about a microphone that was placed in the room. The the meeting wasn't supposed to be taped and in order to get around what this is the suspected bugging the kidnappers had a transistor radio that they would occasionally turn on and off. Mm-hmm. Um, although 
Alberts argued that they didn't turn it on on and off enough to mess with the recording. They weren't meant to record this. This will be very important later on. Just the guy with the giant, a German with a giant boom mic in the corner. Do not mind me. <laughs> I am just going about my job. <laughs> just, just some key grip is just there, like standing in the corner. It's like, don't mind me. <laughs> uh, I'm not recording. Um. And on the 2nd of March, Alberts and the freed prisoners landed in Aden, Yemen. And on the following night, Peter Lawrence was released in a Berlin park. This is really the first incident of the ramping up of action by these groups since 1972. On the 25th of April, 1975, the Stamheim trial was set to begin. But also, at the same time, a group of RAF sympathisers were casually milling about the West German embassy in Stockholm, armed with pistols and explosives. Around lunchtime, they seized an employee who had keys to the upper stories of the building, and then fired their guns in the air. Most people fled the building, and the group gathered 11 hostages on the third floor in the consular office. The Holger Mines commando called the Stockholm office of the German press agency and laid out their demands. The Holder Mines Commando is holding members of the embassy staff in order to free prisoners in West Germany. If the police move in, we shall blow the building up with 15 kilos of TNT. They had already laid out explosives and blasting cables all over the room and warned the police if they did not retreat, they would blow up the whole building. When they got no response, they ordered the West German military attaché, Lieutenant Colonel Baron Andreas von Mirbach, to walk out onto the landing. With his hands tied, he walked out and was shot in the head, chest, and leg. I kind of figured where that one was going when they picked the military attaché. At 3.30pm, the terrorists again called the German press agency in Stockholm, specifying demands for the freeing of 26 prisoners in West Germany, including Meinhof, Bader, Rasp, and Ensling. Towards 8pm, the Swedish Minister of Justice was told was told of the firm stand the government of the Federal Republic was taking. Making a, a solemn press conference in his giant chef's hat and mustache. After a moment of hesitation, he said, we accept this decision. The minister then telephoned the embassy and told the terrorists that Bonn had uncompromisingly rejected their demands. At 20 past 10, that's 10.20 p.m. for the Americans. Uh, 10 burgers followed by 20 burgers. No, it's it's twi- it's ten McDoubles by twenty, you know, m- regular hamburgers. That's fair. Yeah, that's burger time, baby. Uh, burger time. Uh, one of the terrorists then asked for the economic attaché, uh, Doctor Hildegard. He was then led to an open window looking out and handed the phone. Over the phone, he was heard to say, "Hello, hello, can you hear me?" Then three shots were fired. The 64-year-old economic attaché slowly fell forward and lay there, half hanging out of the window, dead. 13 minutes before midnight, the group detonated their charges, the building immediately went up in flames, and in the end, three people had died. The two attachés, von Mirbach and Hildegard, and one of the hostage-takers, Ulrich Vessel. The Stamheim prisoners, um, this would delay the opening of the trial for some time. I can imagine, you know. Also, this is like one of the most violent attacks they've ever carried because like they they carried out bomb attacks and stuff like in the barracks. But like this is different, you know, this is decisively both more destructive and more lethal than a lot of their attacks and like more directly violent because they're not using bombs to kill people. They're just shooting people. A bomb is to whom it may concern, you know, a, a bullet has someone's name on it. So... The Stamheim prisoners' trial would officially begin just over one month later on the 21st of May 1975. Over the court, Now, bear in mind, a lot of the source material spends a lot of time talking about the trial. I've tried to condense it as much as I can because a lot of it is repeating statements. It's, you know, Bader, Ensling, Meinhof, Rasp, kind of fighting back against any kind of, like, judicial movement. And I can't imagine but- that at any point they... We're pleading innocence or anything like like, like no. no, we did that shit. Our defense is you deserved it. Mm-hmm. So over the course of the next tr- next year, the trial would stop and start. Firstly, Bader was adamant about defending himself during the trial that 
uh, citing that because his chosen lawyers were not allowed to be appointed um, and he refused to work with the court appointed representatives, he instead would hear the case himself as both defendant and legal aid. Of course. That's the least surprising thing he's done so far. Then Baller petitioned for the suspension of the trial until he had found defending counsel and was allowed unsupervised conversations with his lawyers. He said that he made that a condition. For three years, he claimed the prosecution had checked every word of the case for the defense by searching cells and lawyers' offices and confiscating mail, and Bader added by planting bugs in the cells used for lawyer visits uh, and we've saying we've known about them since the summer of 73. <laughs> I mean, I also have no doubt that the German state was doing that. Like, I, I don't doubt that they were confiscating mail and all these other things to try to learn more about the upcoming trial. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I'm not giving the German state the benefit of the doubt, but I'm certainly not giving Andreas Batter the benefit of doubt by wanting to be his own lawyer. Yeah. So over the course of the following months, there would be interruption after interruption. The defendants were removed from the court several times due to disruption and disorderly conduct they had undertaken. They argued because of the authoritarian and fascist nature of their prosecution, it was their revolutionary duty to resist the judicial process at with any means. I assume they would do that anyway. I mean, if you consider the state illegitimate, I mean, the same goes for like, you know, the IRA was a good example. They consider themselves prisoners of war, not criminal prisoners. So they held themselves to a different standard. So like uh, you're not going to submit yourself, you know, if you believe these things, uh, how could you feasibly submit yourself to a court you already find legitimate or illegitimate rather? Like and that ideologically to them that makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. They undertook more hunger strikes and on the 26th of September, the ailing health of the group would cause them to be classified as unfit to stand in the court. They came to a unanimous decision that the defendants were suffering from weakness, a poor state of physical fitness, and disorders of speech and vision. They were between 41 and 23 kilos below their proper weights, had low blood pressure and poor powers of concentration, and Ulrika Meinhof in particular was suffering from an actual inability to concentrate. Bader was also found to have an unusually low pulse. Okay, so they finally are doing a real hunger strike once the, once the yeah. trial has started. Okay. Mm-hmm. By April 1976, the group's relationship became extremely frayed. The four years, three of which had been spent in strict isolation, had taken its toll. In particular, there was growing conflict between Meinhof and the rest of the RAF prisoners. Prison officers had sometimes seen Andreas Bader tear up things Ulrika had written and hand them back to her saying, shit. Again, of course he would do that. So, on... So, on Saturday, the 8th of May, 1976, the anniversary of the end of the Second World War, the printers were still on strike. The following Sunday was Mother's Day. All of these circumstances were brought up later in the interpretation of what would happen that night on the 7th floor of the Stamheim Jail. At 7.34am on Sunday morning, two prison officers unlocked the cell 719. Ulrika Meinhof was hanging from the grating on the left-hand window of her cell. Her face turned to the door. Six minutes later, the prison doctor, Dr. Helmut Henk, was on the spot. He determined that the body was already completely cold and saw numerous liver mortis marks on the woman's arms. The corpse was not taken down from the window until 10.30 a.m. Jesus Christ. But by then, a dozen police officers had been in the cell collecting clues and photographing every inch of it. The officers conducting the inquiry reconstructed the way in which Ulrika Meinhof must have died. She had torn blue and white prison towels into strips, knotted them together and twisted into a rope. Then she pushed pushed her bed away from the window, laid the mattress on the floor in front of the window and put a stool on it. She tied the rope around her neck, climbed on the stool and jumped. There was no farewell note from Ulrika Meinhof, but she had written months before in the margin of a paper on strategy Suicide is the last act of rebellion. It rings kind of like um, Jim Jones saying, you know, when he had the People's Temple, you know, mass suicide and also murder people there said, uh, you know, we're not committing suicide. We're committing an act of revolutionary suicide. Well, this is the thing. There is a lot 
of argument around her death. I was sure there was going to be. So one argument argues that the prison officers killed Ulrika Meinhof. You know, the marks on her arms, the way in which she hung herself, the fact that there was no suicide known. Every, like, m- a lot of people argued that if she was going to do it, more than likely she would have written something of a note, you know, in the way that she always did. I can kind of see that. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, she had been in, even years ago, she was writing about the crushing, you know, uh, the crushing depression of being in solitary confinement. Like, this is not uncommon because sol- solitary confinement and incarceration destroys your mental health. Um, not, n- not to mention the hopelessness of their situation. Like, they know they're not getting out of prison ever. Also, there's some other things that are worth noting. One... The fact that the body was not taken down until 10.30 a.m. That's bad. Two, (laughs) two, the fact that the person who conducted the state autopsy was a former SS officer. I mean, that is darkly ironic given the situation. Mm -hmm. Now, some people argue that she was killed by either Gudrun Ensling or Andreas Bader. All of these theories, you know, are... You can argue back and forth about them, and they are really, really just conspiracy theories, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, Occam's Razor demands the most the most simple conclusion is most likely true. Like, if the German state was going to kill these people, they would have done it before they were in prison. Mm-hmm. Before they literally built a wing of a prison and employed hundreds of GSG-9 counter-terror officers to protect them every single day why not just fucking execute them in the apartment and be like, she had a gun? Yeah. And like, like there's loads of like things that were left out in terms of the testing. There wasn't a histamine test administered to the body, which would have helped determine whether she was alive or not when she hung herself. I and mean, they also completely contaminated the crime scene by packing every fucking cop in the prison in there at once. But I, I tend not to buy these kind of conspiracies. I, I, especially when it comes to people being, you know, assassinated in prison or whatever. If the state's going to assassinate you, they're not going to go through the hassle of putting you in fucking prison first. It's a lot more believable that they're just going to kill you in a shooting, seeing how they've already done that uh, a couple of times to the same group. Yep. So on the 16th of May, Ulrika Meinhof was buried in Berlin. Over 4,000 people followed her coffin to the Protestant cemetery of the Holy Trinity in West Berlin. Many of them had painted their faces white, some were masked, they carried banners reading, We bear mourning and rage that we will not forget. Ulrika Meinhof, we will avenge you. And I have a feeling that they did. After Ulrika Meinhof's death, additions were to be made to the Stam- Stamheim group. Prison officer Horst Bubeck, that we mentioned earlier, went up to the seventh floor several times on behalf of the judiciary to suggest which woman member of the RAF might be transferred. In one case, Gudrun Essling said, if she comes here, there'll be a hunger strike. Or uh, Of another woman, it was said, if she comes here, you'll have the three of us dead uh, the day after tomorrow. So, you know, not really fond of other members of the group at this stage. Quite fractious, these, uh, these people are. Yeah. In the end, it was agreed to transfer Ermgard Moller to Stamheim. Soon after, Ingrid Schubert followed, and finally, on the 3rd of June, 1976, Brigitte Monhaupt was allowed to join the RAF founding members in the high-security wing, and they had essentially sent the RAF's successor into their training camp. Outstanding. Well done. Throughout the next six months, the group's lawyers would assist the group by secretly smuggling smuggling in contraband items such as cameras and tools into the prison under the guise of their document folders, like we had said earlier. They were also allowed access to materials on how to, you know, urban guerrilla tactics, how to make bombs, etc. I don't know why they were allowed this stuff. Why did they even have it? Ah. Crack work done, gentlemen. On the 15th of March, 1977, Otto Schilly, one of the group's lawyers, applied for the suspension of the trial due to the wiretapping of the prisoners' cells and their meeting rooms. 
the revelation threw the whole trial into jeopardy as the unlawful wiretapping was tantamount to entrapment of the RAF. A letter from the baden württemberg Justice Minister Bender arrived giving, uh, arrived giving a statement on the matter. I can assure you, first of all, that I fully understand the attitude of the judges and the defence. On both occasions, however, monitoring, uh, monitoring measures had been employed as a method of crime prevention of a purely precautionary nature, and thus had no relevance to the Stamheim trial. Mm-hmm. On the 29th of March, the RAF members would make their final appearance in the courtroom, where Bader announced their application once again to have Willy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt appear in court to give evidence, as well as the baden württemberg ministers Bender and Shea, I don't know if it's Scheiss or Scheiss, uh, to give evidence on the wiretapping. Upon its refusal, he left the courtroom, and the same followed for Jan Karl Rasp, pretty much, and Gudrun Ensling. But before Gudrun Ensling left the courtroom, she informed the judges that the group had begun another hunger strike. It would end up being their last. On the 7th of April, Federal Prosecutor General Siegfried, Siegfried Bubak was murdered in a drive-by shooting by a commando union under the command of Brigitte Meinhop, who had just who had gotten out of prison at this stage, trained by everyone else. While this attack was being carried out, her and Peter Jürgen Buch were in Baghdad staying with Wadi Haddad, a.k.a. Abu Hani. Joe, do you want to explain why Wadi Haddad is really important? I really like how we keep running into characters from past episodes. Uh, Wadi Haddad was uh, um, the, like, the leader of the PFL OP external operations. So like we talked about them in the Entebbe raid uh, bonus episode. He was the one that planned the original plane hijacking that ended up in Entebbe and led to the Israeli raid there. And I'm 99% sure that the Mossad had something to do with his death as a greater part of like their targeted assassination program after um, the Black September attack. Mm. It's kind of like a toss-up. People say he died from leukemia, and other people say that he was assassinated by the Mossad via poisoned chocolates. <laughs> or to try to kill Augustus Gloop or something. <laughs> But, like, it is really interesting how there's so much crossover between, like, everyone who is, like, involved in 1970s terrorism. You know, Abu Hassan, Wadi Haddad, you know. Muammar Gaddafi. Yeah. It's something we didn't talk about because, you know, the stuff with Gaddafi, it's a bit more tenuous than, like, their actual connections to, like, Wadi Haddad and Abu Hassan. Um... It's also worth noting, this isn't in the script, but they were treated like dignitaries on this trip. Incredible. They were, like, put up in, like, Wadi Haddad's, like, really lavish home, and, like, they were there to organize, okay, well, when we get these people out of prison, where can we send them? And, like, they would send, you know, requests to... Uh, the people in prison said, like, would you go here? Would you go mm-hmm. here? Most of them just said no. <laughs> On the 28th of April, 1977, the RAF members, Bader, Ensling, and Rasp, were all found guilty in absentia. The judge read out, in the name of the people, the defendants, Andreas Bader, Gudrun Ensling, and Jan Karl Rasp, are found guilty of jointly committing the following crimes. Three murders in conjunction with six attempted murders one further murder in conjunction with one attempted murder. In addition, the court found the three three defendants guilty of 27 other attempted murders in conjunction with the bomb attacks. Bader and, Bader and Rasp were each found guilty of two more attempted murders and Gudrun Ensling of one more attempted murder. The defendants are found guilty of having formed a criminal association. Each of the three defendants is sentenced to life imprisonment. After this verdict, permanent measures for the imprisonment of the group were set in action and the Stamheim prison was to be modified to suit the requirements of hosting the most, the formerly most wanted people in Germany permanently. Ah, oh, fuck me. So, in reaction to this, on the 5th of September 1977, a chauffeur was driving a wealthy German businessman named Hans Martin Schleyer home from work. Schleyer was the president 
of the Employers Association, a board member of Daimler Benz. He was also a former high ranking member of the SS. Well, doesn't get a much more ripe target than that. He was aware of the danger posed to people like himself by both ideological fanatics and those looking to, you know, score some easy money. Um, Schleyer, as was his custom, had a car hired with bodyguards to follow the vehicle he rode in, he travelled in. Suddenly, a baby carriage was in the middle of the road. Schleyer's driver slammed on the brakes, the car in the back with the bodyguards smashed into the back of his car, and a van drove up. Men from the van ran to the second car and immediately opened fire, murdering the bodyguards in a burst of bullets. They then shot Schleyer's chauffeur and pulled the businessman out of the car and, you know, threw him in the back of a van and sped off. It's worth noting that his kidnappers, while firing machine guns, ran in front of each other's fire. (laughs) Truly a crack team of commandos. Like, that is one way to die very easily. Let's, Let's just say, rookie mistake. So... A letter soon appeared saying that Hanschleyer would be killed unless the RAF prisoners were freed and given 100,000 Deutschmarks each and flown to the country of their choosing. Libya. It was going to be Libya. Accompanying this demand was a handwritten note from Schleyer saying, I have been told that if investigations continue, my life is in danger. The same would apply if the demands were not met and the ultimatums observed. However, the decision is not mine. Horst Herold, commissioner of the BKA, it's, you know, the internal West German agency uh, that coordinates, you know, all the law enforcement around the various states, asked that further proof be given that Schleyer was in fact still alive. The kidnappers comp- uh, complied by making a tape of the businessman a- answering several personal questions. Dennis Payot became a, the intermediary between the kidnappers and the West German governments. He travelled to Stamheim to hand out questionnaires to the prisoners to find out if they wanted to leave prison under these circumstances and asked what countries they wished to journey to. The prisoners listed you know, countries like South Yemen, Vietnam, Algeria and Libya. Nailed it. On September 25th, the BKA informed the kidnappers that both Libya and South Yemen had refused to accept the <laughs> RAF. Imagine Muammar Gaddafi being like, no, we're good. We're good over here. Word traveled to Gaddafi that uh, he was about to receive a man who loved talking more than he did. <laughs> uh, however, the BKA representatives said that Vietnam had not answered yet. So Vietnam, still on the option list. They're a little busy. At the time. Two days later, Alfred Klaus of the BKA met with Jan Karl Rasp at his request. Rasp handed him a typewritten note listing other countries that he and his comrades would be willing to travel to. Do you want to have a couple of guesses what uh, this includes? Take a swing here. Soviet- Bear in mind, it's 1977. 1977. Okay. Uh, Soviet Union, of course. No. China? Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, and Ethiopia. <laughs> Bold choices for the mid-70s. Early in October, the people holding Schleyer sent another photo of him, together with a letter... It's also uh, weird that absolutely none of them ever said East Germany. Yeah. Um, Early in October, they sent, you know, a more recent photo of Schleyer to prove that he was still alive. Alfred Klaus, you know, BKA representative, later visited Bader and Ensling, but he found them... They were a little bit off, you know, they were extremely weak, tired, and they seemed much more morose than they usually were. And on the 13th of October, a Lufthansa plane bound for Frankfurt was hijacked by Palestinians. The four hijackers apparently demanded the release of the RAF leaders. Counting passengers and crew members, they had a total of 91 hostages. The terrorists forced the plane to land in South Yemen where they murdered the pilot, Jürgen Schumann, and shoved his corpse into a cloakroom. Sure, nobody will find it there. (laughs) Yeah. From there, they ordered the co-pilot to fly to Mogadishu, the capital of Somalia, and he complied with their demands. While all this was going on, those holding Schleyer issued another ultimatum. Two Palestinian prisoners must be released and 15 million in American dollars are to be paid for Schleyer's ransom. 
They wanted the ransom delivered by the businessman's son. Unbeknownst to the four Palestinian hijackers of the plane on its way to Somalia, they were tailed by a plane carrying a German anti-terrorist unit. When the terrorists landed in Mogadishu, the second plane was right behind them, and the anti-terrorist unit stormed the first plane. Three of the hijackers were killed and the fourth arrested. No passengers or crew were physically injured except for a female flight attendant who had suffered a leg wound. But back at Stamheim prison, Rasp had been following this drama on a small radio that had been smuggled into him. When the plane was retaken by West German authorities, Rasp communicated the dispiriting news to his comrades via a secret phone system that he had developed, you know, essentially cups and wire. I was going to say they had a large system of string and cup movement. (laughs) Um, this is apparently where they would decide how they were going to get out of prison during the night of October 18th as it would become known Black Night or Death Night the RAF leaders uh, Bader, Rasp and Ensling would meet their end Bader took a smuggled pistol out of its hiding place he shot at the wall then at a pillow some people speculate this was to you know simulate a fight he then put the gun behind his neck and pulled the trigger with his thumb how fucking terrible are these prison guards they didn't hear three gunshots I don't know maybe maybe you're busy you know if you're on your smoke break you're sleeping you know, you know having you know. a dirt nappy time yeah um, and he blew a hole from the back of his neck to the top of his forehead Jan Karl Rasp put a smuggled gun to his temple and pulled the trigger Gudrun Ensling uh chose a method similar to Ulrika Meinhof and took a piece of speaker wire and put it through the narrow mesh covering her window and made a noose, put her head through it, stood on a chair and hung herself. Ermgard Mueller, who was imprisoned with them in the Bader wing, stabbed herself four times in the chest with a stolen knife. That is dedication. Uh, She came within millimetres of her heart. In the morning, the guards found Bader and Ensling dead in their cells. Rasp was still alive, but died soon after being rushed to hospital. This is why, don't shoot yourself in the temple. I mean, the person that stabbed... The the person who stabbed themselves multiple times, they're, they're, they're more dedicated than anybody else. Like, you stab yourself once, you're like, ah, fuck, that shit hurts, I'm gonna quit. Just keep going back for more. Mueller survived, but when she recovered, she vehemently denied stabbing herself and instead claimed that her deceased comrades had been attacked, giving giving rise to the persistent rumours that this was a government mass murder. I assume that's what uh, Bader was going for when he was firing off other rounds. The kidnappers of Hans Schleyer then decided, upon hearing the news of the death of their leaders, to respond in kind. Schleyer was driven to a wooded area and ordered to kneel. Three bullets were shot into the back of his head at point-blank range. He fell forward and the pine needles would still be clinging to his mouth when the corpse was found. A leftist French newspaper received a letter telling them of Schleyer's demise. It read, After 43 days, we have ended Hans Hans Martin Schleyer's miserable and corrupt existence. The Red Army faction pretty much ended at this time. Those who joined after its leader were, for the most part, imprisoned or dead, and those who weren't continued to commit acts under the name of the communist revolution hans herbert Kerry was the economics minister of west germany state of hesse deeply concerned about you know the wave of violence that happened after this he offered substantial awards for information or the arrest of any remaining members of the raf they assassinated him on may the 11th 1981 all right so there's there's still i mean it's got to be a very small group of people Still working. However, by 1981, the RAF had dwindled considerably and its remaining members were growing worn out and disillusioned. Very few remained underground and the West German government offered leniency to those who surrendered and took advantage and those who took advantage of this offer spent relatively small amounts of time behind bars. And in 1998, a communique was sent to Reuters declaring that the Red Army faction had officially disbanded. The end. Huh. I think, like, my favorite footnote to the Red Army faction is one of its members ended up becoming a hardcore Nazi. Yeah, let's talk about Horst Mahler. Yeah. 
Like he's been in prison for hate speech a couple of times, I think. So Horst Mahler, a very early member of the Red Army faction, eventually pivoted to like like Nazi ideology and just became like the stereotype that people have online of like national Bolshevists, like Nazbols. Yeah, because if I remember correctly, he explained it as like, my ideology hasn't changed, the enemy is still the same, and by enemy, he's like, speaking of the quote-unquote Judeo uh, Bolshevik corruption, and he's like a massive yeah. Holocaust denier, which of course is illegal in Germany, and has landed him in prison multiple occasions. Yeah, like uh, in like 2000, he joined the NDP, which is the National Democratic Party of Germany, which is like the far right, as far right up until the founding of like the AFD. Yeah, which I'm sure um, he's a huge fan of, if he's still alive. Yeah, and like, you know, he, he made some like interesting comments about, you know, 9-11. Oh, I'm sure I can he, guess what those interesting comments were. He was, you know, charged for Holocaust denial in 2004. You know, he's been, like, in and out of, like, legal trouble for the entirety of his life. Uh, I guess when you go from, like, street gorilla and, like, kind of be given a second chance at life, you, you're you not going to be normal again. Yeah. And the most recent news on Horst Mahler... You know what he tried to do in 2017? Oh, I was going to say recent news is probably something to do with COVID denial, but since it's 2017, what was it? He tried to seek political asylum. Where? In 2017. Russia. Hungary. Perfect. <laughs> so that is the end of the Red Army Faction. Joe, have you got a question from the Legion? I do. So if you'd like to ask us a question from the Legion, you can donate to the show. Ask us to it on Discord, Patreon. Um, you can load it into a conspicuous mail parcel and mail it to Tom. Uh, don't do that last one. That's probably illegal. Um, Please don't. <laughs> today's question is, if you could redesign the seven circles of hell, what would be the mildest punishment you could think of? Chewing with your mouth open. Mm, like you're just surrounded by people like chewing cud like they're cows forever. Yeah. Either that or wearing you're forced to wear like mildly uncomfortable shoes for eternity. Like they're like not a half size too small. Not, not even a half size. They're just like they're your size, but either they're slightly too narrow, so it's like a little bit uncomfortable. I would hate that so much. Or you have to wear a t shirt that's a little bit itchy where the tag is like scratch in the back of your neck a little bit too long i am gonna say my most mild version of the seven circles of hell would be you walk in and everyone around you is carrying out a cell phone conversation on speakerphone <laughs> that's a good one or um or you're constantly trying to listen to music but it's always buffering yeah or you have to queue for something for eternity and ev like the person in front of you and behind you are just like slightly too close for comfort. Yeah, not quite touching you, but you can smell them. Yeah, yeah. that's just called going to the airport. <laughs> I mean, yesterday when I was on the overground, there was a literal bag of feces on the ground. Oh, that was so mine. I was wondering I where I left that. <laughs> God damn, I left my <laughs> shit bag. But uh, Joe, thank you so much for letting me host a series once again. Um, I really enjoyed it. I spend so much time reading about Andreas Bader and him being really weird, and I feel like I am free now. <laughs> You're free of Bader thought. No, it was it was great, man. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed being subjected to Andreas Bader. Um, and yeah, man, thanks a lot. Uh, I, you plug your show. Um, yeah, listen to Beneath the Skin, the show about the history of everything told through the history of tattooing. You don't necessarily have to have tattoos to listen to it. It's a fun history show where we talk about how tattooing interweaves with a lot of history, like stuff like, you know, Russian prison tattooing, uh, colonialism in the Pacific. Uh, we ha we're doing a series about people who've influenced tattooing who aren't tattooists. So we've done one about the history of pinups. We're doing one about the inventors of, uh, you know, modern animation like Max Fleischer and Tex Avery soon so yeah if that sounds like your job check it out thanks again and if you like what we do here consider supporting us uh, via patreon you can get episodes like this early 
You can get access to our Discord. You get access to five plus years of bonus content, including the Intebiorate episode, which we've talked about, and all of our various Gaddafi related nonsense that we've talked about. Um, you get stickers, you get uh, pre orders on merchandise before anybody else. And, you know, of course, you help support the show uh, and leave us a review and wherever it is you listen to podcasts, it helps us immensely. And until next time, uh, I don't know. Wash your goddamn self. T- take, take a shower. <laughs> yeah, don't be so annoying that John Paul Sartre hates you. That is a good one. Don't be so annoying in your, in your political ideology that everybody who's ever met you hates you. <laughs>